that you're affiliated with has rules and regulation that govern how they operate. And therefore, the person that understands that and the person that operates in that will greatly benefit from uh, their involvement with that organization, their relationship with that organization, or just being, like I said, being a part of that organization. Say amen to that. But in every organization, not only is there uh, some procedures, there is an order that everything must flow in. Uh, and it amazes me that uh, the, the church has more disorder than any other organization on the planet, right but yet and still we want to claim the blessings of God, and which is not really, which is really kind of naive because how can we have so much disorder not only in the body, but in our lives as, as God's children, and then claim we have the blessings of God? The only explanation for that is I've never received any. So I don't know how to even respond to what they look like or what they remotely, what they do for me or what they can, because I've never experienced them. So I'm just basically saying what I hear everybody else says along the way. I'm just claiming the blessings of God. What about habit? Yeah. It's because in order to have the blessings of God, that, that the, my life must come in line with the order that, is, uh, that God has set up within his kingdom. Say amen to that. And the kingdom of God has an order. It has a, has, it has a way of, it's, it's, the, it's the, the way God has designed he wants his children to operate in order to, 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 to benefit from this relationship with him. And so we started off, we, we looked at John, John chapter 15. I might be rehearsing myself, but it's okay. Uh, I really, uh, as we go through these lessons, my desire, as I sought the Lord in this, my desire was that all of us could kind of come through together because when, when people miss and, uh, and don't uh, learn these teachings, when then something is required, they're not equipped right. to do it. Right. And when people are not equipped to do it, then they find fault. Yes, they backstab me. Yes. They undermine what I'm trying to do because they don't understand. And then those who understand scared to tell them, we've had this. We've been taught this. So, and it doesn't, make good to, it doesn't do any good to, to learn something and then speak opposite of what you learn. I wish I had a witness. So anyway, but anyway, so we have to, so, and, and so in this, in John chapter 15, we looked at how Jesus, on his way to uh, Jerusalem and then on his way to the cross, stopped to give his disciples this teaching as it relates to how he and them uh, uh, figure into this order that God has set up. It, it's not a, it wasn't a new thing for Jesus because when he existed in word form in the garden, God had an expectation of Adam and Eve when he said when he placed them in the garden, he said, be fruitful, be fruitful, multiply, multiply, replenish, and subdue it. So God has always uh, had an expectation attached to those he deals with. I don't know where we get that from, that there's none. We run the church, we run our lives. The church runs itself as if God has no expectation, and we disguise it. Under the auspices, I'm spirit filled. I do what I want to do. There's no such thing. No. There is no, that's a lie from the pit of hell. Yes, you don't do what you want to do. If you do do what you want to do, what you can do, you're not experiencing the benefit of this relationship. And like I said before, not many believers in this town can even claim having experienced the, believer, the, the benefits of being with God because they don't even know what they look like. They never experienced healing on a, on, a, on a regular basis or deliverance or anything like that miraculously happening in their lives. They're just claiming what they hear everybody else say. Say amen to that. So anyway, let's keep moving. So, so God has always had an expectation. But in this particular text, in John chapter 15, and I want to take you back to Genesis to let you see that when Jesus was saying in John chapter 15, that was not the first time it came to be. If you track God's involvement from Genesis all the way up until Jesus came and then probably on after, you'll see everyone that God was involved with, that was an expectation that he had of them, and that's why he used them. There's always an expectation. Every prophet, every person, every person that God had any involvement, that was an expectation. And really, the greatest benefit of being in this organization with God is that he chooses you. I don't think many people understand what that's like, because most, most people go on their own, especially us who like to rebel. We don't get chosen. We just go and claim God chose us. Wow. Holy Ghost, help me. 
So, so in this, he established this order of how, thing, uh, how he relates to them, how he relates to them and how they relate to him and then how God relates to both of them. See, when we come into this relationship, when we, come, when we accept Christ as our Savior, we enter into a new dimension of operation. We enter into a new dimension of how we do things, how we live. We, we enter into a new dimension. That's why we must be taught how to initiate our role in this relationship. That's, how, that's why we must, we must learn the language of this kingdom, the, the operations of this kingdom, how this kingdom functions, the ups and downs of this kingdom, and not only that, but how to benefit the best out of a relationship with God who is the, who is the CEO of this kingdom. Amen. Not only this kingdom, but of all kingdoms. So, so he says in John chapter 15, as now, as he, as he, as Jesus is headed to the cross, say headed to the cross. Amen. He stops, he, he, he stops and began to teach the disciples because Jesus understood his role in coming to the earth, say amen to that, as part, he's, now, he, now, now he, he leaves heaven as being one of the instruments used in building God's kingdom, and then he comes to earth and submits himself to the authority of that kingdom. I wish I had a witness. He submits himself to the authority that he already sets up because he can't come to earth and operate like he did in heaven. Right. See, when you come to earth, there has to be a submission to the operation that is in the kingdom of God. So he says in John chapter 15, verse number one, he says, he, uh, I am the true vine and my father is the husband man. And in verse number two of that text, and he said, verse number two of that text, he says, every branch in me. Jesus, every branch that is in him, Jesus, beareth not, that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. God takes away. He doesn't do it. God takes away. He says, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, uh, that it may bring forth much, much more fruit. So in this text, he involves, and, and for all your people who say the Trinity don't exist, say Jesus just told us in John 15, 1 and 2 that the Trinity exists. He talked about himself. He talked about God, and there's a spirit of God right in there, too. So that's the Trinity right there. So he says, uh, uh, he says, I am the true vine, and we went back to Isaiah chapter 5 to show how that Israel was chosen to be the first true vine, and they failed. And the reason they failed was because they did not produce the type of lives that represented the relationship that they had with God. God called it wild grapes. They produce wild grapes. Their lives are out of control. Their lives are unbalanced. Their lives had no, no, uh, no example of being children of God. They were in constant rebellion. They were constantly rebelling. They were constantly in and out, up and down, all around. That didn't change his choice about them, but it did change how God was able to use them in the grand scheme of things. So they could no longer be the first that he wanted because of their wild, great production. So I, I, in looking at this, one of the things I learned, you know, like, don't fool yourself in thinking that you're representing God when your life is all out of whack. Amen. Amen. You see, we, again, we've taught, we've had, we've had erroneous teachings. We know God understands and, and God, this God understands the menagerie. God does not understand anything concerning sin. You better be glad we got Jesus as our advocate. But then Jesus said, no, I have sympathy for you, but I'm not agreeing with you. I wish I had a witness. So the idea then, he says, I'm the, so Jesus then says, out of all, out of Israel couldn't get it done. At, first of all, Adam couldn't get it done. Say amen to that. And uh, Adam couldn't get it done, so God had to deal with him that way. He and Eve, they messed it up. Then Israel didn't do it right, and everybody along the way didn't do it right. So Jesus says, I can't. But then Jesus comes and says, now I'm the true vine. I'm the gentleman article. There, there won't be, there's none before me and there won't be anyone after me. I am the genuine article. I am the true vine. So he sets himself up as the, as the vine in the relationship that we have with him. And then he's going to bring God in to show you how God's involved. He said, I'm the true vine. Then he says, my father is the husband man. He's the caretaker of the, of the, of the, of the, of the field that the vine is in. So it's God's, it's God's job to take care of the field, to take care of the, uh, uh, the, the environment of the vine, and to do all the things. Jesus said, I'm the true vine, and my father is the husband, man. So he's a general article. Now, again, like I said, when we accept Christ as, his, as our personal Savior, we become part of the vine. We become part of the vine. But we've been wild grapes. Wild grapes don't know how to operate 
in a, in a controlled environment. As a matter of fact, we, when we accept Christ, the grafting process kicks in. Israel were chosen. We were a second choice based on Israel's rejection. Say amen to that. So since Israel was chosen, they was already part of the vine. See, just because you accept Christ, you weren't originally a part of the vine. I was not originally a part of the vine. I had to be grafted in. But in being grafted in, I became part of the original vine, and that put me in line with everything Israel has, I have. I mean, not only that, but I even, my, my grafting takes me all the way back to Abraham and grafts me right into his family. And now whatever Abraham promised was promised, I have as a promise. I wish I had a witness. But I, I was a wild grape. And back to my original question. Now, wild grapes must have, must, now wild grapes have to learn how to operate in a controlled environment. Does that make sense? See, wild grapes must learn, and the only way wild grapes can become the kind of grapes uh, that God wants, there must be instruction and teaching on how to, how to operate in this new environment where I've been placed. Amen. Without, that, I'll, without that, I'll say I'm connected to the vine, but my production will be wild. Yeah. And if my production is wild, can I, get, can I justify connected to the true vine? The answer is no. But see, like I said, we've excused ourselves and explained so many things away, and because of lack of understanding, we've agreed. And so therefore, we, we are say we're connected to the vine, but there's no evidence that the sap that runs from the vine to me is coming out of my life. Well, <clears throat> so... <laughs> Amen. Say, so, so, see, people don't like this kind of stuff. That's why it's only like 20 people here this morning. Say amen to that. Now, so, so, then, so he says, I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. He's the caretaker. He's the dresser of the vine. And, he, and, and actually, we get a good example of that in Isaiah chapter 5, how he spoke to Israel when he told him, look, I've done everything for you. First of all, I found you. You didn't find me. I found you. You, you weren't the biggest Sure weren't the smartest. Right. You weren't the wealthiest, but I chose you. Matter of fact, in, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, 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 later on in Scripture, he tells them, I even sacrificed Egypt for you. They belong to me, but I sacrificed them for you. So you, you didn't have any, don't think you had something going on because I did that. That's how, so God is explaining to them what he does as the dresser or the keeper or the cultivator of the vine. I've kept people off you. Amen. Enemies who was twice your size, Amen. you defeated. Right. Explain that to yourself. Right. Abraham goes to get Lot. He's a, he, he don't know anything about fighting. He's only got some servants that's been with him for a long time. They band themselves together, go get Lot and defeat three kings' army. And, and then God goes, really, Abraham? Really? You think you did that? You think you had enough strength to do that? Then he gets into a guy named David, and he kills a guy nine times his size, nine times over his weight, nine times the armor, nine times, and he goes, really, David? You think you got it going on like that? Then he looks at us and says, y'all be tripping. You, know, you, don't, you ever look at where I brought y'all from, what I've done for y'all? How I've kept y'all, watched over y'all. I've used people who you hate to help you. I've used people who you hate today to get you where you are right now. And then you're going to do me like this? That's kind of hard, isn't it? Isn't it? You have to take a look at this thing from a personal perspective. Right? You have to look at it and you have to, you have to take it on as personal and not group. But he teaches them that I'm the true vine and my father. So every, every believer in this operation, say amen to that. Many times we forget to take surveys of the cultivating God has done. I wish I had a witness. Yeah. We sometimes get to the point that we've always had it like this. We've always been like this. We've always had it good like this. Instead of being servants, say, you know what? 
Man, I remember the time, man. How did I get out of that? How did I get through that? How did I make it through that? You see, so Jesus says, I'm the true vine, and my father's a husband, man. And then he goes on to say, and gets to verse number two of the text. He, now, he's, he, what he's doing is introducing disciples. He says, first of all, in this relationship that you're in with me, I'm the true vine. You can't be that. You can't be the vine. There's no way. You don't have what it takes to be the vine. I'm the true vine. I am the true vine. That's, 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 that's my position in your relationship with God. I'm the true vine. Your hookup is me. Your connection, me. Nothing you have, nothing. Without me, you got nothing. Amen. That's why he tells them, I'm the way, the truth, and I'm the truth. I'm the, I'm, the, I'm the hookup that you must have in order to claim legitimacy in the kingdom of God. He says, I'm the true vine. Then he says, my father's the husband, man. And then he gets to the next point. Here, here's the next. He says, every branch. Now he introduces them and us as branches off the vine. See, you're a branch. You're a limb on the tree. You're not the tree. See, the tree is technically the trunk of it, the root system in the trunk that goes in the middle. Everything else comes out there is branches. You ever notice when you cut a branch out, the tree don't die, but the branch does? It may live for a little bit, but without that connection... And if you ever notice when you prune a tree, it grows back bushier and fuller and more. It's a crazy process, but it works. So Jesus says, he says, now he says what? Every branch in who? Every branch in him. Every branch that is connected to me, every branch that is, that is in me, that connected to me, that is a part of me, does what? He said, every branch that bears not fruit, he takes us away. So that in Christ, there's only two kinds of branches, as we mentioned Wednesday night. Those that produce something and those that don't. In other words, there, there are no branches hanging on Christ that's saying, I'm waiting. God working on me. He ain't through with me yet. I, I ain't got all my ducks in a row. I, I, I still got some issues I'm working. There's two kinds of branches. One that produces and one that doesn't. One that produces and one that doesn't. Now, I'll take you back a little bit. When you look back through, when you look back through the Old Testament, uh, you see this in operation. You see it. You see it because this branch system really was introduced. It, it really began before Christ came to earth. It was with Christ. It was with God and Christ, even as he talked with Moses and David and all those others. There was this system that God operated in. And everyone he talked with became part of the branch. Everyone he chose became part of the branch. And then as they became part of the branch, God always then sent them on an assignment because there was something they were supposed to do. That's what bearing fruit is, doing something. See, any tree... He, well, let's go back to the text. He says, every branch in me that does what? Bears not fruit. I'm going to ask Keenan this question. Keenan's a great... Keenan's on his way to being a very, very good baseball player, okay? Yeah. Now, he understands because they have to practice. Baseball is, is, is unlike, to me, it's unlike any other sport you can play. See, first of all, because most people say it's boring, the people that think baseball are boring, they lack the ability to think. Yeah. See, because see, football, action, everything's happening, moving, all this kind of stuff. Hockey, basketball, but baseball. Baseball and golf are the only two sports that people say, that's boring. I don't understand. Ain't nothing going on, really. That's because you don't have a baseball mind or a mind for golf because there's more going on in those two sports than the others. So, Kennedy, but in the process, so baseball has to be practiced. Now, you practice football and you practice all other sports, but baseball, when you practice baseball, you have to practice what you're going to do. And you have to become proficient in what you're going to do. So, in practice, the coach makes situations. Okay, let's, let's turn a double play ball, but ain't no runners on base. See it in your mind. Right. 
So he makes situation. The baseball player then takes what he says and sees it in his mind. And if he's playing first, if he's playing second, if he's playing short, if he's playing third, even if he's playing outfield, and the coach says, okay, we got men on first, we got men runners on first and second, okay, where's the play? He's got to formulate that in his mind. What do I do if the ball comes to me? Because when the ball comes to me, there's nobody else involved but me. If I don't know beforehand what to do with that ball, if I, if I stutter in my thought process, a stutter in my production one little bit, that runner going to cross the plate and we're going to be behind one run. So the baseball player has to get an image of what he needs to do before the ball is hit. Golf the same way. A golfer sets up his shots. He don't just hit the ball down there randomly. He surveys the field. They have what they golf. They have what they call practice rounds. You know what the practice rounds are for? They're for guys who never played the course. They go out there and they hit the ball from every position on the course and see where it goes. See how the how the fairway takes it, how the greens take it, so they understand the slope. And that cat is, has this book, and they every hole. Okay, if you hit it from here, the ball goes and drifts right. They add an arrow down here. Or you hit it this way, it goes left. So when the tournament, you ever notice when they're playing a golf tournament, guys pull out these big books? Every hole, they're looking at where the ball went during the practice round. Why? So I know how to hit it to get it in the hole. See? God wants us to think just like that. To knowing what to do. That's why we're in this operation. But in order to do that, we have to be attached to the vine. See, the vine is our source of how we think. I'm, I'm Greek now, right? Yeah, see? Yeah. So, so he said, so everybody God used, he always gave them this outline, gave them this program, what they're supposed to do. Then he's sending them on their way. In other words, what you do with this is how you're going to bear fruit for me. I'm not saying it so. In the fruit bearing process, Jesus says, every tree that bears not fruit, what God does? Take it away. Who takes it away? God takes it away. Now, let me, let me show you this. What was Adam's and Eve's job in the garden? Be fruitful, multiply, subdue, and, and replenish the earth, right? They didn't do that. They chose to do something else. Now, God took them away by putting them out of the garden. So there is a taking away. Yes. Now, it doesn't say, it doesn't, now, Israel got took away. Didn't say God changed his mind about their position, but it sure took them out the way. I wish I had a witness. See, because when you start talking like this, people go to my, ah, well, you can't lose your salvation. You get it. Well, if you ain't really producing, did you ever have it? You see, that's my argument on the table. No, how, you, you really can't lose your salvation if you never had it. And if you really have had it, there ought to be some evidence. Say amen to that. Amen. Glory be to God. Yes. Amen? Does that make sense? Now, you have to, Anthony, now, I'm a, I'm a, can I use you for an example? When you, back in the day when you was on the street doing your thing, right? There was some evidence that you were on the street. I know you. I know you're holy now. And, <laughs> Same into that. You, I, we need to remember things like that. There was some evidence that you was on the street, right? And there was some folk who verified the evidence and they wouldn't bother you. Uh-huh. Right? right? That was, in other words, people could see you operating or saw you operate, saw what you did, saw what you were capable of doing, you know, and you didn't just talk about it. You did it. Well, I can't say that because they think the preacher always holy. So, hey, you know, say amen to that, right? So, so if, if that's the case when we were living like hell, say amen to that. Even the devil wants production out of his converts. And we gave him mass production. Say amen to that. Didn't we give him mass production? I'm guilty. I claim mine. Don't worry about it. It'll be all right when you get to heaven. It'll be all right. I claim mine. I claim all, I claim all mine. Say amen to that. It doesn't matter if you didn't do as much as one or as least. It doesn't matter. Whatever you did, you were good at it. 
and you you didn't need much training. You didn't. We didn't need much coaching. We didn't need nobody to push us or all that. We just we just volunteered it and did it and had a good time doing it. Didn't feel guilty. Didn't have no remorse because we didn't. We had nothing better to compare it to until we bumped into the vine. The vine gave us a comparison. But like most folk, now we in the vine, now we're quiet. Now we don't want to do nothing. Now we just want to sit here and enjoy the relationship. No, joining the vine was not just to have a relationship, but it was now to start production of the real type of fruit. <laughs> now watch this. I got to show you this, I got to show you this right? Even, even when we were out there doing our thing, once we changed... We got cut off. The boys don't want to hang with you no more. You ain't pulling as many girls as you used to. You talk different. You act different. You hang around them church people now. Bro, we can't roll no more. It's amazing. They cut us off and we try to hold on to them. Say amen to that. Glory be to God. So anyway, Jesus says, uh, every branch in me that does what? Bear is not fruit. When we look at fruit now, I think many times when we look at this text, even myself, I thought it was what we were doing for God. But no, when I look at the comparison with Israel in Isaiah chapter 5, he says they produce wild grapes. And then when I study the history of Israel, I see in their lives rebellion, constant, constant turn against God, constant going after other gods, constant seeking some other type of relationship other than his, and he constantly having to allow things to happen to them. So it, it's, uh, I look at it now as it's not what I am supposed to do for God. It's the life I live in him. Right. See, because if, I, if my life must first be fruit, the example that I'm connected to the vine. Right. Amen. And that's what God wanted to do with Israel. He wanted to show all the other nations around him what it would be like to hang with him. And as a result of that, they would come and join. We got, as a matter of fact, I think it's in Matt, Romans where it says, I chose you Gentiles to make the Israelites jealous. The idea was that they would be so jealous of what I'm doing with you, they'd come back to me. I wish I had a witness. Glory be to God. So he says, every branch in me that bears not fruit, he taketh away. Then he says, and every branch that bears fruit, he does what? Purge it, that it may bring forth what? More fruit. So now, on this, this tree of Jesus, you got branches. Two kinds. One that bear fruit, one that doesn't. You know why I like the, I, I like the one by Jesus' part? It's because we, you and me can be on the vine. And if I'm fruit bearing, I'm going to get pruned. If you're not, you're going to be taken away. Say amen to that. Why? Why? You, he takes away that which may be a hindrance. <clears throat> To the growth of the other branches. You see? But also I see in this text, every branch of me that bears now and every branch that purges me. In other words, there's two branches. One will, one won't. The one that will has disciplined itself to the purging process and the, as, as a result produces more fruit. Now, so when a believer does not bear fruit, it can either happen two ways. And I think it's in order of this. First of all, based on what comes out of their mouth, right. will determine if they bear fruit. Right. Say amen to that. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speak. Many people are attached to the vine, but they don't have the voice of the vine. They don't have the speech of the vine. And if your speech is not a divine, you're not going to produce. Then this is not going to produce. God can take, takes that away. Doesn't say what he does with it. Doesn't say he casts it in the hell and forget about it. He just says he takes it away. He takes it away. Now, so he said, every branch of me that, y'all all right? Did you go home? Every branch of me that bears not fruit. Then he says he purges it. He purges it. Uh, and I look at that as uh, like uh, when I was a kid, in my, I think I told you this Wednesday night, maybe not. When I uh, was a uh, kid and uh, before we got ready to crop tobacco, we had to always go out and do a couple of things. We had to weed it, chop the weeds from around it, and then we had to go back uh, about just before cropping, and then we had to go back and take all the suckers out. 
suckers out. You, you, you have to be kind of like from Georgia, Carolina, they understand sucker, you know. So anyway, a sucker is that you, you, have, you have your tobacco stalk. It's, 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 it's the stalk. Then the leaves come out on the stalk. Like, like a, for lack of a better word, it looks less like a collard green. A tobacco plant and a collard green are very similar, but I wouldn't advise eating <laughs> a tobacco plant leaf. But the leaves are pretty much equal. The only difference between a collard green leaf and tobacco leaf, the collard green leaf has more wrinkles. The tobacco leaf is more straight. It's, it's, a, it's a leaf that's formed like that, but it's just big and straight over and has a big stem run down the center. Well, anyway, so you have the, the tobacco stalk right here. Then you have a leaf coming out like this, and they start really on the ground. Well, between the stalk and the leaf in that joint, a sucker will grow. It's not tobacco. It's not stalk. It's a sucker. They call it a sucker because its whole existence for being is to rob the plant of all the nutrients so the tobacco won't, produ won't, won't flourish. Say amen to that. Now, they grow up with the stalk. The Bible calls them tares. They grow right up with the stalk. Okay, now, now you can't, you, you, if you leave them in there, you're guaranteed for your crop to fail. So they have to be, again, now, they used to give us this little knife, little short blade, and you had to learn how to go down in there because the, the, the key to removing the sucker is not to damage the stalk or the leaf. Cause that, so you have to learn to take this little knife with a blade about an inch, maybe long, inch long or something like that. You had to be able to go around in there and cut the sucker just right. So you could get it out from the leaf and the stalk, but at the same time, don't break the connection with the leaf and the stalk. Once you did, then you would take them and pull them out, throw them on the ground. Once they pulled out, once you pull them out. Now, once they are taken out of that stalk, they never come back. They don't ever come back until the field is planted again. But see, all suckers must be taken out or they damage the crop because it, the, tobacco, the tobacco stalk uses more energy growing the sucker than it does the leaf because it's foreign. It's robbing nutrients and it's not even tobacco. It ain't tobacco, it ain't stalk, it's foreign. It ain't tobacco. It ain't tobacco stalk. It's, it's not even like any other plant in the field. Because once, once you get the suckers, you have to go out, then you have to hold the tobacco. Tobacco is really a very delicate plant. You have to hold up, get all the weeds and stuff from around it, because the least little interference will shut its production down. Say amen to that. So, so, so in, the, in that process, we who used to work in tobacco become the cultivators of the tobacco. We become the ones who protect the tobacco. Our job is to make sure the tobacco that grows and produces, and we go out in the field, we pull up all the dead grass, we hold from around it, we make sure there's nothing hindering the growth, and the last thing we do is we take them suckers out. Then on the very top has this very pretty plant that comes from tobacco that looks like, oh, that's so pretty. It's the last sucker on the plant, and it comes out of the very top, and you have to take that out. So even though it's disguised, as a pretty plant, it's a sucker. And all it's doing is robbing the tobacco of its nutrients that it needs to make real, genuine tobacco. Do you get the picture? You see? Plenty of folk in the church can say it right, dress it right, sound just right, maybe even look just right. But at the end of the day, God knows there ain't nothing but a sucker. He knows cause he, because he, un, he looks at the heart of the branch. And the heart of the branch tells him if they're going to be a real branch or they're a sucker. And, he's, and Jesus said, God takes all the suckers away. And, now, and then it says, in the branches that are left, they're producing fruit. And it said, they must undergo a pruning process. Why? To produce more fruit. And I, I made the example of, in 1 John, there's a, there's, a, there's a text that says, as we... As we get near, near to the light, we, we become more like the light. Yes. The idea of the text is, I'm paraphrasing, the idea of the text is, the more and closer I get to Jesus, the more his light exposes my flaws. Right. 
So it's, the, it's, it's kind of even though, so I'm producing fruit even though I got flaws. Yeah, I got flaws. Everybody God used produced, but they produced while they had flaws. <laughs> Say amen. Paul, Paul says like this. That's what Paul said. That's why I glory in my afflictions. Because my afflictions don't stop me producing. I glory in my afflictions. Why? So that the grace of God will be more evident on my life. I got issues. I got flaws. But I'm not allowing my issues and my flaws to stop me from being productive. I'm not saying God got to rid me of all of them. He can, but I know one thing, that doesn't stop him from using them with my flaws. Amen. Say amen to that. Amen. Say, I got flaws. I don't, I don't think right all the time. I don't want to do it right all the time. But when he surveys me, when he looks at the part of me that is that, is that part his, or do I have it belonging to someone else? When he looks at that part and says, that belongs to me, then God said, don't worry about it. Flaws going to come out along the way because I'm going to purge you. you produce. So God can produce flu- fruit out of a flawed person as long as the heart's not flawed. <laughs> Somebody ought to clap now. Now, the, 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 the unflawed heart, say amen to that, is the mindset. The unflawed heart is the mindset. The unflawed heart is the believer who has decided, made a conscious decision that I'm going to follow Christ. Amen. Conscious decision. It ain't here. It ain't the person who feels good about Jesus. It's the person who has made a conscious decision to follow Christ based on information received from Jesus, the word. Right here. Say amen to that. So he says, every branch of me that bears not fruit, we take away. Uh, every branch that bears fruit, he purges, that it may do what? Bring forth what? More fruit. That it may bring forth more fruit. Remember, the branch is nothing but a mirror of the vine. The branch is nothing but a mirror of the vine. It's a carbon copy of the vine. It's the likeness of the vine. The same sap that comes from the vine, rolls into the branches. It's not a different sap. It's the same sap. See? And so what the, what the caretaker of the vineyard is looking for is a bumper crop from the vine that has all these branches connected to it. Anybody ever seen a real vineyard? Real vineyard is really pretty. When it's cultivated, you know, great, great vineyards are probably the most, uh, are probably the cleanest fields you'd ever want to see. I mean, the, the, the grounds are immaculate. There's, there's no, no weeds and none of that stuff. It's always immaculately kept. And the grapes, they grow off in these clusters. I mean, like big clusters just hang off like this. And when they go off, they have a little knife where they just cut the cluster off. They leave the branch and they just go snip, cut the cluster off. And then they go back to and they prune them. They prune them down so that when it prunes, see, when you prune a good branch, you prune off like the end of it. When it grows again, it looks its own. Then it grows past the pruning. And every, every, every step past the pruning is another place for clusters to grow. See? So the pruning process is designed so that every, everything God prunes off of me, I grow past it again to produce more fruit. I keep growing past it to produce more fruit. I keep going past it to produce more fruit. And that makes God, that glorifies God. Does that make sense? So, so, in, in, the, uh, so in the grand scheme of things, in this relationship with Christ, with, in, uh, and, and uh, as he would have it, he is the true vine. God is a husbandman, and, and there's an expectation not only of Christ, but of God, that every person connected to him should have a fruit-producing life. Every person. Now, remember what I said. The proof of your connection, the proof of my connection is, first of all, what comes out of my mouth. Right? How many lessons have you had already on how to speak? Call things is not as though they are. Yeah. Say amen to that. How many times have you been warned about because we've learned how to speak like this world, you have to really concentrate to make sure you don't talk 
like you've always been talking and start talking like the scriptures. Because the proof of the connection, say amen to that, is in the talk. And the actions follow the talk. And the talk comes from a mindset. And the mindset, which verifies the talk, which verifies the action, let everybody know if you're connected or not. But you don't have to worry. Your secret is safe. Our secret is safe. Because most people we talk to, they don't know if they're connected either. <laughs> Say amen to that. Nobody's going to challenge them on it. Say amen to that. they pretty much doing like everybody else. They say the right religious things at the right and proper time. And it makes them sound like they connected. <laughs> say amen to that. But Anthony, on the corner, you know if somebody for real or not, don't you? It don't take long to find out, do you? Say amen to that. That's why on the corner you can always pick out a narc. From the regular guy. Right. See, a narc has to be trained in how to talk street language. Right. And a street guy knows the difference between trained street talk and grown up, growing up street talk. Right. Say amen to that. Amen. I, I, I need a crowd that ain't so holy, but it's all right. <laughs> Glory be to God. Now, so, he, so, so that, that pre- let's see now, let's see what, if, we, if we want to. Uh, now, oh, I, I talked about, um, now. Well, God, okay, turn to, I think I mentioned this. I may have not. I say, oh, yeah. We talked about Israel. We talked about our relationship to Israel. And so really, in the grand scheme of things, in Romans chapter 11, verse 18, 21, which I covered um, uh, Wednesday night, uh, Romans, uh, Paul warns us not to talk bad against Israel and not to talk down about Israel. Say amen to that. Because don't think that we have it going on so well with God that we can badmouth them. Because just like God expected they expected, just like God expected something from Israel, he expects something from us. And as I leave it there, I'm going to close with this. God, God is, God is the ultimate investor. Amen. See, God is the ultimate investor. He's the ultimate investor. And every investor invests with the purpose of getting or receiving a return. When an investor invests and what he or she invests in is not giving them the return they're looking for, they either pull out of that investment and go into another or drop the investment altogether. Say amen to that. I don't think, I I know God is not any different. God is not in the habit of wasting time with people who ain't ready. Say amen to that. You have, have you ever tried to drag somebody with you where you know you're supposed to go and they don't want to go? And you trying to make them go because they're your friends? Right. This kind of relationship breaks up friendships. It'll break up homes, really. Right. Say amen to that. Amen. Because God is the ultimate investor. Everyone he deals with, he expects a return because everyone he deals with, he invests himself. Right. Right. Amen. Yes, sir. He invests himself by his word by his spirit he invests himself so since God since God invests himself he looks for the return because he's put himself into the commodity he's invested in and when the commodity he's invested in does not give him a return you know what that means that means the commodity is exercising their will not to do what God has invested in them and therefore, God has to take it away. Does that make sense? Yes. It's quiet in here. Amen. All right, so with that, now, so, so he says, uh, so, so we can't brag or boast uh, about uh, us being in, Israel being out. And see, that's one thing you have to watch about erroneous teaching, you know. A erroneous teaching trying to make you think that God now prefers the church over Israel. Be careful about the things you say because God is not like an Indian giver like we are. Israel is still his chosen people. Say amen to that. The church now just has a place in God's plan, but Israel is still his chosen people. Say amen to that. We're just a saved generation by which he is using now, say amen to that, which called the church age. That's what we are now. We're in the church age. So the church age is a body of believers that have been called out by God, right, filled with his spirit and, and his word to do what God wants on the earth. Say amen to that. 
So God still requires something of the investment he's placed in us, each of us. Amen? Now, in John chapter 10, verse number 28, write that down. Jesus says, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of me. It is impossible for another man to take you out of the hand of God. But it's not for God to take you away out of his own hand. God reserves the right because of his sovereignty, because of his creative power, because of all he has. You know, another man can't move you. <laughs> but don't get your man thinking confused with God. And see, sometimes that's what happens with us. Because what man can't do, we become, we become uh, uh, self-righteous in thinking, and God can't either. No, no. You ask Nebuchadnezzar. See, Nebuchadnezzar, I, and I close with that, Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel's day, Nebuchadnezzar was not a God-fearing man. And God sent him messages concerning what was going to happen through his prophets. When Nebuchadnezzar didn't pay any heed to it, so God made him like a beast of the field. He stayed out there, I think, seven years eating grass and all this kind of stuff. And God's, God's word was, Nebuchadnezzar need to know who I am. Right. Say amen to that. Amen. You see, and I don't think even the church really understands the authority that God has. Wow. Say amen to that. It, it, we, we, he's not just the God of your salvation. He's the God of the world. Even the folk who ain't saved, he's the God of them too. And see, we need to start, stop talking about him as if he's just the God of the church. No, he's the God of everybody. Right. And so when you're talking to people who ain't saved, it's my own believing God. I don't care what you don't believe. He's still your God. I don't care if you don't believe. I don't, I don't go to church. Nobody ask you about that. Well, I'm this. I'm that. I don't care what you are. You can be a Buddhist, a Kudist, or whatever the case may be. You, at the end of the day, I say, I guarantee you, go and research everything you're trying to worship, everything you call religion, and you're going to go right back to Genesis. Because what you're doing has been tried before. Israel tried. That's what God called going whoring after other gods. Ain't the first time this ever happened. And God always just stood the ground. You're going to know who I am. You're going to know that I'm the real deal. So I, I tell you all the time, I don't care what you believe. I don't believe in that. I don't care. The truth is, he's your God. You just don't know it yet. And then you do know it. You're just denying it. Say amen to that. Okay, that's about it for this morning. Put your hands together. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Y'all real quiet today. But anyway, so good night. In, as, we, as, we, um, as we move into morning service, we're going to begin to look at, uh, we're going to go, we're going to exalt, we're going to try to exhaust John chapter 15 in this particular study of this abiding process because we